Hello and welcome back. This is a lecture on chapter two of the textbook, Adapting Your Message to Your Audience. One of the uh, great classic topics for not only business communication, but uh, any sort of rhetorical analysis class you might take or, or a speech class. You know, pretty much any class that involves communication will talk a lot about the need to really understand the audience and be able to being able to shape your message to that particular audience. So that's the topic for today. And we're breaking it down into seven learning objectives. So we'll talk about identifying the audience, analyzing different kinds of audiences, choosing the channels to reach those audiences. So email versus text versus a phone call, adapting the message to the audience, characterizing good audience benefits, creating, creating audience benefits, and finally communicating with multiple audiences. So quite a bit to cover, so let's just jump right. All right, the first step is identifying the audience. And we want to think about different kinds of audiences that we might be addressing and how their their role and their response will be will differ. Uh, so let's use the example as we're going through here of a resume with a cover letter. So you know what a resume is, I'm sure. Uh, the cover letter, or I guess a, maybe a cover email nowadays, would be a document that goes along with that resume that just kind of uh, you know introduces who you are and the job you're looking for and so on. Uh, so let's just for now just, let's just stick to that resume. Okay, so let's think we sent the resume, we wrote the resume, and now what do we do with it? Uh, it might go to what we call a gatekeeper. Uh, so this gatekeeper, uh, maybe this is your your best friend or your spouse, and it's somebody that you say. You know, can you take a look at this resume and, you know, let me know, does it look okay? Uh, and they say, maybe they say, yeah, it looks fine. Send it on. Uh, or they might say, you know, actually, Matt, <laughs> uh, you've got lots of errors on here. You left some important stuff out. Uh, you shouldn't send this. Uh, so that could be a gatekeeper. Uh, another gatekeeper might be the, maybe somebody that works at that company and who gets all these resumes in and they're, maybe they work for human resources. And uh, they might take a sort of make the first pass through these resumes and say, well, we know that the uh, we're only looking for people that have a, a bachelor's degree. So I'm going to quickly go through these. And if I can't figure out whether you have a bachelor's degree, uh, then we're just going to you know, stop the message there. Uh, so that could be a gatekeeper, too. So hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, now we get to the primary audience, and these are the people that are going to be deciding or acting on the basis of that message. So again, if we think about a resume, clearly this is the, the, the manager, the hiring manager, the boss. Uh, this is the person that will decide based on that resume whether you should be called in for an interview or not. That's a pretty easy concept to grasp. Uh, the secondary audience, though, is people that they're not maybe they're not personally responsible for that decision but they they still have a role to play maybe they're asked to comment on it uh, implementing ideas is another aspect so when we think about the resume maybe the boss let's just say this is a uh, an executive type and they're, they're looking for a computer programmer a database a security expert or whatever so the manager will ultimately be the one to make the decision, uh, but maybe she or he or she isn't quite an expert in this topic. Uh, so, you know, the manager might give uh, let other people in the company look at it, maybe the IT department, and the, those folks will take a look at it and say, yeah, this person seems fine, or you know what, <laughs> uh, we don't think this person seems qualified. Uh, so they're not personally making that decision. But they're still commenting on the resume. They're still, uh, they still have a role to play. So, again, hopefully this is making sense. Uh, so a step uh, beyond that would be the auxiliary, auxiliary audience, people that might encounter the message but not interact with it. Uh, they just read. They're in a read-only role, uh, need-to-know need basis. Uh, so this is, I'm not quite sure who this would be in context. Uh, of the resume, uh, I guess maybe somebody that's just inputting the information into a database or something. Uh, one one example I did think about was the 
U.S. Army. And the Army has a lot of documents, a lot of rep uh, manuals and things uh, that they write for the, the soldiers out in the field to use. Well, there's a whole category of survival books. So, you know, a soldier might get isolated somewhere in, in the wilderness and have to basically live off the land, right? So there's, there's all kinds of training courses around that topic, and they have books that go with them. And, you know, those books will go through multiple drafts and editors and all this stuff. But, uh, but there's another audience uh, of people that like those books that uh, such that you can go to Barnes & Noble Bookstore and actually just buy these army books uh, about wilderness survival. Now, clearly, you're not part of the army. I guess you could be, but if it's just somebody like me, I'm just reading it for fun uh, or maybe because I'm interested in the, in the topic. But I'm probably not going to go out in the wilderness somewhere and try to implement the ideas. And I'm certainly not going to be uh, interacting with, with sergeants and, and, or whatever soldiers in the Army. Uh, so really, I'm just kind of reading it, uh, but not commenting on it or I'm not uh, implementing those ideas. I'm just reading it for fun, basically. Uh, so I think we could say that's an auxiliary audience. And then they talk about the watchdog audience. Uh, so somebody exerting economic, legal, political, or social power later. Uh, so this, uh, there's something called the Freedom of Information Act that you probably heard of. And what this, what you can do is, let's say you work for a newspaper or you're part of a, a group, maybe you're trying to stamp out corruption or government spending, uh, or you got some kind of agenda, right? Or maybe you're a lawyer, an attorney, and you can use this Freedom of Information Act to get access to these documents, memos, or emails. Um, and then you could look over that and see, well, hey, you know, there's some evidence here of corruption. And you could actually uh, sue the company uh, if you're a lawyer. Or maybe uh, you could come back to haunt somebody politically. You know, the stuff that was, again, nobody thought about this watchdog audience. Maybe they never thought that anybody else would read the email or get the report. Uh, yet here it is. So that's another audience, and some might argue that this is probably the most, one of the most important audiences to consider, uh, right? So you might think, well, what if you know, I'm sending this email now? I know it's not going to, you know, it's going to be fine for my primary audience, uh, secondary audience, and, and so on. But uh, what if a lawyer was looking at this, or what if this got into the hands of uh, my competition, or what if this got leaked out to the press? Uh, you know, there's that kind of factor. And that's what's called the watchdog audience. Now we're talking about analyzing your audiences. So if we're thinking about that uh, audience of the resume, the, let's say we know it's going to go to a human resources manager, uh, eventually maybe get to the uh, hiring manager. What can we, how can we think about, how can we analyze that audience? And the, and the book says, which I think is uh you know, a good place to start is uh, using common sense. And a lot of the stuff that students ask me about their resumes, really, they, they know the answer. Uh, <laughs> you know, they ask things like, well, sh you know, should I, uh, is it, should I put my um, high school diploma on there? You know, should I, should, I say, should I say what high school I went to? And I'll say, well, let's just, you know, let's just use some common sense. Um, is the, is the person that's going to uh, be deciding whether to hire you or not, uh, is this information going to be vital? And the, the student might say, well, not really, because if I have a college degree, uh, that sort of trumps the high school, right? Uh, you'd probably only put the high school there uh, if you didn't go to college. Uh, you know, and th then it would might be a factor, but, you know, the college degree is going to trump. It's going to make it basically irrelevant. You know, and same thing with, uh, they'll say, well, what about this activity? Uh, you know, I was part of, uh, I, I was part of the rowing team at St. Cloud uh, State. Should I put that on, on the resume? I think, then let's, you know, let's use some common sense here. Is it relevant uh, to the job? And a lot of the times uh, they'll say, you know, maybe it is because it kind of shows that I, I can be part of a team. I can uh, communicate well. Uh, we can uh, function as an organization, right? Uh, so a lot of this stuff does just kind of come down to common sense. Uh, you probably already know the answer, but you just don't trust your, your judgment. Uh, secondly is using empathy. And this is, I think, very related to common sense, but you're really focusing on 
uh, putting yourself in that other person's position, trying to feel uh, what they say, feel with that person. Uh, so again, one of the examples that comes up all the time in my line of work is students uh, emailing professors or uh, asking professors questions in class. And they'll, you can always tell which ones haven't used empathy uh, because they, uh, they'll come across as being really arrogant or even rude or disrespectful. And usually they don't want to be like that. You know, that, that's not what they're, they had no idea they were even being disrespectful. Uh, it's just they didn't use any empathy, right? They, uh, they just thought about themselves only and didn't think about how this might come across uh, to that person. Uh, so uh, some of the examples, other examples of this, um, let me think. Uh, well, let's just, let's just, let me do it to you, right? So let's say you have had, you're really sick. Uh, so you're emailing me and you're saying, I couldn't turn that work in because I was, you come down with the flu and I've been really, <laughs> you know, ill. Uh, you'd really want me to practice empathy, right? Uh, to put myself in your shoes and imagine, well, what if I was really sick with the flu? You know, how would I want my professor to respond to that? Uh, that would be a lot, uh, you'd, you'd much prefer that, right, than somebody that was unempathetic and just say, well, you know, the, this is the policy and you, uh, you know, I said this due date and that's that's all that matters. <laughs> and so really using uh, empathy and common sense will go a long way towards uh, helping you to analyze that, that audience. So now let's look a little deeper into this. So it says you can analyze your audience as individuals. And this is usually the case I would say probably most communication in a business context is uh, emails or texts or phone calls or conversations. And you know exactly who it is you're talking to. Uh, and you know from experience that people are different. Uh, different professors uh, will give you different grades for the same kind of work, right? This is an example off the top of my head. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, this is in some ways, I guess, preferred uh, because if you know exactly who's going to be reading it, uh, then you can tailor that message uh, more easily uh, than if it's a second situation, which is a, a group. Uh, so you could imagine if instead of just writing to uh, me, uh, you're writing to the entire uh, English department uh, <laughs> or even the, all the professors at St. Cloud. Uh, or you could imagine if you're writing a, a message to uh, a club, uh, maybe you're writing this message to uh, a political party even, uh, so you can see at this point, you have to kind of have to be more generic. You have to use more generalization. Uh, you're not going to know as much about them as you would the individual. Uh, that said, there are some ways uh, to sort of tap into this. Uh, they talked about demographics, uh, which could be uh, age or income, education level. Um, if you know, for example, that the audience will be kindergartners, well, that's, you know, as a group, you can think, well, what are kindergartners like? Uh, what are people, what is it, you know, five or six years old? You know, what are five or six year old kids like? And if you keep that in mind, it will help you to tailor your message because, you know, obviously they won't be able to handle uh, really complex uh, vocabulary. Uh, you probably want to have a more friendlier tone, uh, right? Uh, psychographics will get a little bit more involved. We'll, we'll talk more about some of these personality tests. Uh, in a minute. And then beyond these groups, you might have entire organizations. And, you know, if you're writing, maybe you are, you know, think about St. Cloud State as a big organization, right? There's lots of different pieces in play, uh, lots of different kinds of people that work for that organization. Uh, but nevertheless, there is this sort of ideal of a culture, right? The Huskies, uh, there is, some, you know, the St. Cloud State's a different university than uh, Mankato <laughs> or a uh, Harvard or whatever. Uh, there's very different organizational cultures. And if you want to if you want to be effective as a communicator, you need to start looking at these differences, even at that big, biggest sort of level. Uh, and this, this idea of a discourse community. And uh, this is there's lots of examples of these, uh, but uh, you could think about a discourse community of well, let's just say Harry Potter. Right. Or let, let's take uh, sports. Uh, so let's say uh, if you're like me and you just kind of you like sports, but you're not really part of the discourse community. Uh, that's just a fancy way of saying, you know, I might watch sports casually, but I'm not like a hardcore 
sports junkie. Uh, and if you ever gone to a sports bar and you hear these uh, folks talking about a game, it's like they're talking about that game on a whole different level. Uh, I mean, the terms they're using, they're, they, they know all this stuff, all these statistics and player names and coach names and the histories of a team. And uh, it's really, they've kind of got a community. It's really just kind of a little community of fans. Uh, and I'm not just kind of as a casual sports fan, uh, I'm not part of that community. I can't talk to them on their level. Uh, I could, but I would have to invest the time and the energy and, and have the, the passion to do it, right? So that's what we really kind of mean by a discourse community. Now, how do you analyze individuals? Uh, they talk, uh, first, of all, <laughs> first of all, just talking to them. Uh, so yeah, this is just, again, common sense. I mean, if you want to get to know somebody, you, you talk to them, right? Uh, but if you want to get more scientific about it, you can use this Myers-Briggs Type Indicator <laughs> Preference Test. Uh, so we'll get into this. I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, although it is, it is a lot of fun, this test. And, uh, if you've taken it, I would like to, if you're comfortable sharing, I'd like to know what, what it said about you. If, if, and, and what is, what, uh, whatever it says, does it jive? with your experience, but, and this is where concepts come from, like, are you extroverted, introverted, sensing, intuitive, thinking, feeling, or judging and perceiving? And here's some more stuff about this Myers-Briggs personality type. So uh, you can see this, this really gets involved. Uh, so you got the uh, introverted, gets energy from within. Uh, usually you think about somebody who's bookish or who's kind of shy, really. I just doesn't like uh, being the center of attention uh, versus the extrovert who gets energy from interacting with others. So I'm definitely part of this introverted group. You know, I would I, I feel much more comfortable <laughs> in my office uh, or teaching a small class. I like that better than uh, a huge class or big auditorium uh, kind of setting. Uh, I don't really like uh, going to these conferences and doing this social networking thing where you're meeting a whole bunch of new people and you know, just not real comfortable in that uh, environment. Uh, but some people are extroverted and that's actually what, you know, they, they thrive on that kind of stuff, right? So they could be what you might heard of as, as a people person. Uh, this is just a way of saying, extroverted is just kind of a way of saying they're, they're people people. And so you can see here the I introverted and some of these will be E for extroverted. And then the S, or let's see, S or the end, N. So either a sensing person, you get information from five senses. In other words, you like to look, look at it or hear it, <laughs> uh, smell it, I guess, uh, versus the uh, in, in, intuitive, which I guess this is the N for intuitive, uh, sees relationships. And so I guess a little bit more uh, of an abstract thinker. So I guess you could think about maybe, would you say like a hand, this one would be more like a hands-on or a visual learner uh, versus somebody that was better at just, you know, applying the terminology. And let's see, uh, this is the third one here. Thinking uses objective logic to make decisions. So you might think about, oh, I don't know, Spock <laughs> from Star Trek or maybe Sheldon uh, from Big Bang Theory. Or feeling makes decisions that just feel right. So uh, that's the F there. So I don't know about you. I'm probably more of the, the feeling uh, person. Uh, think about the car. <laughs> you know, if you're buying a car, uh, I, I kind of you know, want to know, does that car feel right to me? Does it kind of jive with my personality? Do I like the feel of this? Uh, you know, I said just my gut sort of tells me I should go with this one. Uh, versus somebody that was more of a thinking oriented person might say, well, you know, look, let's just look at the price of the car. Do you really need that big of an engine? <laughs> uh, you know, let's just be logical about it. Uh, I think we can all get some idea what this is about. And then finally, the last one, you're either the judging type, uh, you like closure and certainty, or if the perceptive type, P, likes possibilities. So I guess you could think about this as, uh, and I'm not quite sure if this is what this would be a good example or not, but maybe somebody who just coming back to being a teacher, 
you know, some, some students really like it when I give a writing assignment and I have very detailed instructions. You know, like, here's what I want in section one, here's what I want in section two, and, and so forth. Uh, whereas other students like it better when uh, I just leave the, that stuff open. I say, just write whatever you want. <laughs> or uh, you you tell me uh, how long it needs to be, or, or whatever. Uh, so that, I definitely see different types of students. Some some definitely, it seems like most of them like the closure better, but you cert I certainly get more creative types uh, who want a little bit more flexibility. Uh, as to what type of assignment they turn in. So now that we've talked about analyzing the individuals, uh, we can think about what you could analyze as, as far as a group is concerned. And they talk first about the, the common features. So again, we were talking about the kindergartners before. Uh, what if you were giving a talk to, uh, let's say, the humane society, local humane society, and you probably wouldn't know, they're, they're, these people might be very different ages. You wouldn't necessarily know how it would break down in terms of uh, gender and so on, but you know that they like animals and you could probably go from there and think about some other things that might be likely if they're part of the Humane Society. Uh, map profile of the group features. Uh, so here, this would be very useful. Again, if it's something like the Humane Society, they have records, obviously, of the people that belong to that. And you could get a look at the uh, the age brackets. You know, is it mostly young people, older people? Is it just all over the place? Uh, same thing with the gender, uh, education level, income, and so on. Uh, the psychographic quality features, values, beliefs, goals, lifestyles. Uh, so you could probably think about this you know, the Humane Society again, and you could probably start to fill in some, some values for them, right? You know, uh, they value uh, uh, animal rights or treating animals well. Uh, the beliefs, they probably believe that animals feel pain, uh, for example. <laughs> uh, I would assume uh, if you thought that animals didn't feel pain, you wouldn't be part of that um, group, right? And goals and lifestyles, you can start to plug all this stuff in. And the more of these you can plug in and, and fill out, the more information you'll have on that group and the better you'll be able to tailor your, your speech or your report. Now at that biggest level, the organizational level, uh, they talked about the organizational culture before. So the values, attitudes, philosophies. Uh, so what about, you know, if we're looking at St. Cloud State, uh, really any university will value education and have a you know positive attitude about learning and so on. Uh, they'll have uh, philosophies you know about the value uh, um, or teaching philosophies and so on. Uh, but if you want to get thinking more about St. Cloud State in particular, you know you might start getting into things like well we value uh, more teaching over research. Right. So some universities they value uh, their attitude is you need to be publishing research. And that's more important than being a good teacher. You know, believe it or not, that is <laughs> quite common. Uh, so it'd be nice to know uh, if you're giving a speech to St. Cloud State that, well, here at this, in this uh, university, they value teaching more. Not that they don't care about research, but the teaching is more important. And you can learn things like that. They talked about the myths. Uh, this is getting really far out, right? The <laughs> uh, stories, heroes, documents. Uh, I would fill in something like for documents. If you look at awards, like some corp some companies will have like employee of the month award, or uh, maybe somebody gets a promotion, uh, or somebody gets uh, written up in the newsletter about how good of a job they're doing. And this this would all be good spots to look for. Uh, these values and attitudes and philosophies. Uh, shows in use of space, money, and power. Oh yeah, this is <laughs> yeah, this uh, this is certainly true, right? Uh, the professors that some professors have bigger offices uh, than others, right? And they might have uh, bigger classrooms uh, for some topics. Uh, they'll invest more money in certain fields. Uh, power, and I don't know about the power part, but uh, you could get it get at this. Uh, if a, if a, if a you know, place like St. Cloud State, look at the the STEM building. 
you know, how nice and new <laughs> that is. You know, clearly they value the uh, STEM fields. And then if you look at uh, other fields, maybe there's less less attractive of a building. There's not as much money tied up in it. Uh, maybe the not a lot of uh, influence over the other uh, parts of the university. I won't go, <laughs> go into detail about which ones those are, but uh, hopefully that helps you to uh, think about that organizational culture. So here are some questions we can ask about organizational cultures. Uh, is the organization tall or flat? Uh, so is there kind of a, a big boss and uh, that all powerful boss and the org, org chart uh, where everybody has a, a specific role and you're not even allowed to talk uh, to people higher up on that corporate ladder, uh, that would be the tall one. Or it could be a lot flatter. Uh, so maybe you work in a place where everybody's more or less equal. Uh, they have different job titles, but you know it's not so uh, compartmentalized, right? And, and clearly this would make a big difference in how you communicate with that, that culture. Uh, how do people get ahead? Uh, maybe they're driven by there, the commission, bigger the commission is, uh, the, uh, that could be a factor. Maybe it's uh, how well they coordinate with others, or uh, maybe it's just seniority based. Is diversity or homogeneity valued? And so clearly uh, here in the US, we have a place a huge value on diversity, uh, but you can't just assume that's true everywhere. A uh, lot of different countries in the world, right? And uh, they might be uh, totally on this uh, homogeneity. Uh, bandwagon instead is uh, friendship and social and sociability important uh, so you could sort of think about companies that you might have worked for over the years and how uh, sometimes it's a very sociable atmosphere and lots of friends there uh, versus other places where nobody knows uh, one another and you're, you maybe you're even discouraged uh, from getting to know your, your fellow employees their coworkers. Uh, formality, behavior, language, and dress. Again, I don't know what kind of experiences you've had in the workplace, but I can tell you, uh, you can definitely find some jobs where they expect you to be really formal all the time, very professional all the time. Uh, uh, you know, you're wearing the shirt and tie or the, even a suit uh, at some jobs. Maybe other jobs, uh, they don't care what you wear. You know, you shorts, sandals, uh, whatever. Uh, so clearly that's a huge difference. Uh, what the workspace looks like. Uh, this, this can give you a lot of insight into a company, right? If, 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 it's, if it looks nice and there's lots of decorations and <laughs> potted plants and exercise balls to sit on, uh, that's a very different kind of workspace than something very corporate, you know, and, and a bunch of cubicles and very bland uh, atmosphere where you could imagine some huge sort of workhouse, workshop, factory setting. Uh, you can learn a lot about that organizational culture just by looking at the, the space, right? Uh, what are the organization's goals? So a lot of, uh, maybe the organization's goals are just strictly to get more money, right? Just to make a profit. Uh, but other ones might have different goals. Maybe they want, you know, you can think about an organization like the Humane Society. Uh, they're probably not really concerned so much with, the, you know, the money is kind of a means to an end for them. Yeah, they want donations, but uh, that's not the goal is not to raise as much money as possible. The goal is to help as many <laughs> animals as possible. Uh, so you can see how the organization of goals, again, would uh, really have a big impact on the type of culture that you have there. Uh, so now we're talking about those discourse communities again. And one of the questions is what media formats and styles are preferred for communication? So if we're thinking about those uh, uh, the sports fans they probably like to have voice or face-to-face uh, -face communication in a in the sports pub of their choice right uh, we could think about other kinds of groups though uh, maybe a, a fan fiction community harry potter fan fiction uh, they might prefer to interact on a discussion board somewhere it's mostly text-based or you could think about different companies you work for and and how some uh, there's a lot of emailing uh, versus another place where there's mostly phone calls and you know this this is going to vary between those communities oh, what do people talk about now, what topics are not discussed and so this is uh you know you can think about that sports community again 
Uh, obviously, people are talking all about their favorite team and sports and so on, but maybe there's some topics that they don't ever discuss. Uh, I'm thinking about, uh, say, I, well, I would say that sports people usually don't talk politics. <laughs> they they want to kind of keep their politics separated uh, from their sports talk, but it seems like that one's kind of blurred nowadays. But, uh, so I don't know, but uh, I'm sure you could find groups of sports fans where if you did try to bring up uh, the political stuff that's, hey, you know, we don't want to talk about that. We want to be friends here. Let's just, <laughs> you know, avoid that part of the topic. Uh, what kind of evidence and how much is needed to be convincing? Uh, so I think our sports fan analogy holds up well here. You know, if I say, well, this coach is better than this coach, or this year's team is better than uh, that team, last year's team, uh, then they would they wouldn't just be satisfied with that. You know, they'd say, well, what, you know, what about this player? And uh, you know, what about these stats? You know, so I might, <laughs> you know, basically I have to do some research, or at least have a lot of uh, stuff memorized to be uh, able to convince them. All right, so communication channels. Uh, this kind of comes back to what we've been saying before. Like, should you call? Should you email? Should you text? Uh, they say the means by which, well, they define it, uh, communication channel, the means by which you convey your message. And this is useful to think about. I know a lot of students defer, or they, they always want to use email for everything. And they don't want to text their professor. <laughs> At least I've, I've never, what is this, you know, probably 20-something years of teaching. I, I've never received a text. Uh, from a student. I don't know that anyone would want, I've never even been asked, like, uh, what's your number for texting? You know? <laughs> that, that's just unheard of. Uh, but they do like emailing, and every, and they, every now and then they might call. Uh, but it's usually, it's 99% email. Uh, but sometimes I'll say, you know, there are times when it would be better to have a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, they don't like that usually. Uh, or the, <laughs> you could just call uh, with this. So let's just think about this. Let's say that you, um, you know, you're going to be, if this were a face to face class and you know you're going to miss a class and you wanted to uh, communicate that information to the professor, uh, obviously the phone call would probably be, that uh, would have certain advantages, right? You could call if you get a hold of me, uh, then that's immediate. Uh, you know for sure that the message was conveyed because uh, you, can, you can verify that. And cost would be kind of negligible. You know, if this was a long distance call, that'd be uh, one thing, I suppose. But uh, so let's think then about the email. Uh, so the email would be sent immediately, but we don't know when I would receive it. That's the big thing. Maybe I didn't even check my email that day. Uh, accuracy. There could be some issues there. You know, did I interpret that correctly? Uh, maybe send it to the wrong person by accident. Again, cost kind of negligible. Uh, so let's move on then to number of messages carried. Uh, well, e email, uh, I guess that's billions and billions of messages carried. Phone calls, probably not not nearly that many. Uh, I'm sure you don't make as many phone calls as you do emails. I could be mistaken about that. Uh, but really, you can only effectively talk to maybe one person at a time. Maybe if you're doing conference calls more. Uh, but it definitely seems to be limited there. Uh, and I guess that brings us to the next one, number of people reached uh, the email. Obviously, you could make that to one person or 50 people. Uh, telephone call, I think we get kind of hard after like two or three people on a conference call. It's, it's kind of awkward. Uh, efficiency and goodwill, uh, goodwill. Yeah, the phone call might be more efficient sometimes. Um, sometimes people think say that if it's important, you should call because that shows your you have goodwill. Uh, it's, it's a little tactless uh, to communicate something, some bad news, just over an email. <laughs> the usual joke is, you know, if you're breaking up with your significant other, uh, you probably don't want to do that via an email or a text. It just seems kind of, uh, <laughs> or, or worse, a Facebook <laughs> post. <laughs> you know, that would seem to be kind of mean. Uh, it seemed like it would be nicer to do that, at least in a, in a, a more personal way. And same thing if, you know, if somebody's being fired, uh, you want to try to soften the blow as much as possible. So anyway, I'd be curious to see uh, how you would uh, break these down.
Now choose channels based on the audience purpose and situation. Uh, so you could think, let's think about several different communication channels, texting, emailing, uh, maybe uh, let's, let's even throw in like a Skype video conference call, uh, traditional phone call. Uh, does anybody send these anymore? Formal letter. <laughs> uh, you know, in which of these, you know, maybe if I'm thinking of my own life. I'm sending my grandmother, for example, loved mailing letters. She would mail me letters. I'd mail her letters. Good old fashioned handwritten postal snail mail, whatever. She, she just really enjoyed that. And it made her it made her happy. Uh, so I would choose that. I'd write her a letter. Yeah, I could have called her instead. I could have. I don't think she had email, but I wouldn't do that anyway because I know my audience. I know she prefers the uh, handwritten letter. Uh, purpose. So again, we can think how different it would be if you're, if you're sending somebody a birthday card. Uh, if, if it's somebody's birthday, you want to say happy birthday. Yeah, you could just email that. But somehow, sometimes uh, sending that card seems uh, more fitting for that purpose, right? And same thing with situation. Um, I think this, you know, there's obviously a lot of people buy those greeting cards for a reason, right? It's uh, if you want to congratulate somebody or say uh, um, maybe somebody's died, right? And you're, uh, you're sending a condolences. Uh, the card is probably going to be a better choice than just a, a text or an email. Um, so all this stuff will vary based on these, these uh, situations. All right, so here's a little exercise uh, for you. So pick the best channel for each situation and tell me why you think this would be the best channel. Uh, an instructor who wants to cancel class. So if I need to cancel my class, uh, that would be kind of weird since it's online, but you know, if I were a face-to-face -face instructor and needed to cancel the class, what would be the best channel? Email, text, phone, you, you get the idea. So that's the first one. A uh, second one, a, non, a small nonprofit organization who needs to reach contributors. Product recall notifications. Notice to all employees about a new smoking policy outside corporate offices. All right, so just briefly pick a channel for each one of those and tell me why you think that would be the best choice. All right, so now we're looking at the six questions to adapt your message. How will the audience initially react to the message? Will they see it as important? And what is their experience with you? Uh, so what were we just talking about? The uh, instructor canceling class? I'm pretty sure you would see that as an important message, right? Uh, what is their experience with you? Well, you're a student in the class, right? Uh, maybe uh, I've never canceled class, or maybe I frequently have canceled class. Um, Maybe that would fit into that second one. Uh, two, how much information do they need? What do they already know? Does their knowledge need to be updated? Uh, what do they need to know to appreciate your points? Well, obviously, the what the, <laughs> the most important thing is what, when will the class be canceled? And how long will it be canceled? Uh, you might say, do I need do I need to really go into detail about why I'm canceling it? You know, I'd say probably not. Uh, it's not really. You might want to know, you probably don't care. Uh, it's, it's probably neither here nor there as far as your concern. Um, we want to do a different example. What was uh, one of the other ones there about the product recall? Uh, so you might, maybe they already know that there's something wrong with it. And, or maybe they don't know what's wrong with it. So that could be something. Um, what do they need to know to appreciate your points? Well, is it something dangerous? Is it, just kind of a inconvenient thing. Uh, why is it being, is it unsafe? You know, these are all things that would fit under the second one. Uh, what obstacles must you overcome? Is audience opposed to your message? Uh, well, I like to think uh, so. Yeah, sure, the student says, oh, I don't cancel class. Uh, <laughs> uh, probably not going to be the case, though. Uh, will it be easy to do as you ask? Well, this can be a factor, right? Uh, if I, if I know I'm going to have to cancel class like a week in advance or if I know like two or three weeks or months ahead, uh, it's easy. Yeah, you just don't come in that day. Uh, but what if it's like uh, like classes in an hour and I'm suddenly I'm like violent, violently Ill, Ill, sick and I can't do it and 
this is a problem, right? Because you, some, some students might have to drive in from far away, all the way from the Twin Cities. And, you know, they, suddenly they, they get this message, maybe just as they're pulling into campus that the, uh, the class is canceled. Uh, so that'd be really uh, inconvenient. Yeah, it's easy. They, they still don't go to the class, right? But I, I certainly have, uh, there's now there's like, they might be mad about it, right? Uh, they, they came all that way. Uh, so it's, it's just something I'm, I can't really control it, you know, but I still have to factor that into the message. Uh, maybe in that case, I'd want to be a lot more apologetic. Like, I'm very sorry to have to cancel the class today. Uh, I know it's inconvenient for you, um, especially if you've dr driven in from a long ways off. Uh, but if it's like three or four weeks in advance, uh, you know, it's not really, you're probably not going to be upset. There's probably really no need to apologize. Uh, you get the idea. Uh, the positives I can emphasize, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have picked this particular example. Uh, well, the benefits for the audience, um, I guess, let's just put it this way. If you know far enough in advance and you can put it on your calendar, it can save you the trouble of coming in. Uh, you'd probably say, well, the benefit is I don't have to come to class that day. I would say that's not really a benefit, but, you know, maybe your, your mileage may vary. Uh, what do you have in common with them? experiences, interests, goals, and values. Well, you know, I've been a student before, obviously, so I can relate to this situation. Uh, my values and my goals are probably a little different, as you could probably already tell. Like, I, you know, as a student, I'd have been like, yeah, I don't have to go to class. It's awesome. Uh, as a professor, though, I'm kind of different. I'm like, well, you know, is my class really that irrelevant? <laughs> or is it really that painful to go to class? You know, I don't want it to be bad to go to class. Uh, so you can see there how, yeah, some stuff I can relate, but it's going to be different. Uh, what does the audience expect? Uh, what writing style do they prefer? Uh, well, you, you know, as coming from a, a professor, you'd probably expect it to be grammatically correct, uh, fairly formal, uh, maybe not like, you know, robotic. You want it to be friendly, I suppose, but... It'd be a little weird if I was communicating to you in like emoticons or like, you know, you for the the, let, uh, the letter U for you, Y-O-U, things of that sort. I don't know if you would hate it. Uh, you just would think it was weird, right? Uh, are there red flag words? Uh, so I'm trying to think of what that would be in, the, in this context. Uh, red flag words, I guess something that might alarm you somehow or, or make you nervous. Maybe if I made it sound like, uh, uh, instead of just saying I'm a little, or maybe if I, if I emphasized in there somehow that, you know, I'm, due to my death, being deathly ill, <laughs> I can't, I'm not coming to class today. Uh, maybe something like that would, you know, you'd feel like over, like really concerned and, and panicked about it uh, when that was inappropriate. Uh, how much detail does the audience want? Again, you don't want me to go into the, the, uh, detail about my medical condition. You know, what, what's the word? Uh, TMI. You know, <laughs> I don't really care. Uh, you're sick. Uh, you're not going to be, you're canceling class. Uh, that's that's what we need to know. Uh, uh, the details of your uh, digestive uh, system or whatever. Uh, we don't need to know that. Uh, we don't need to know it. Uh, direct or indirect structure. You probably don't want to be direct uh, with that. Not a lot. You don't want to have to read several paragraphs to figure out, uh, oh, class is being canceled today. Uh, you don't want that. Uh, you want to be upfront. Uh, the basis of a lawsuit. Okay, almost done here. Uh, the characteristics of good audience benefits, advantages the audience gets from using your services. Uh, so. It's nice when I can talk about a class like this and say, you know, when you take 332, you're going to get all these advantages. Uh, you'll, you'll be a better communicator and so on. You'll learn how to use some tools. Uh, buying your products. You know, I'm not selling products here. <laughs> uh, but you could imagine any kind of, if you ever looked at any kind of catalog, uh, they have points there about, you know, why, why should you buy that car? Uh, following your policies, uh, well, let's think about like the attendance policy in a class. Um, usually, if you if you have perfect attendance, you might get a, a bonus. 
uh, bonus points, but if you don't follow it, you might get some nasty stuff. But here we're talking about uh, stressing the positives, right? So if you show up to class every day, uh, or if you turn all your work in on time, you'll get a better grade. Adopting your ideas. Uh, let's see what else we have here. In informative messages, benefits equals reasons to comply uh, with the information. Well, you know, again, this is very commonsensical. You know, if it's a, a, a manual, uh, you know that, yeah, you want to put the furniture together the right way. That's why you're complying with their steps. Uh, and a persuasive message benefits equals the uh, reasons to act. Uh, so if I'm trying to persuade you, I guess, to, to be on class or to go to every class and be on time, there's benefits with that. Uh, and the negative messages benefits <laughs> not used. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's, you know, if you, if you got some bad news, there's probably not a whole lot of. Uh, and so here you are with the uh, uh, four criteria for audience benefits. Uh, adapting the benefits to the audience. Uh, sometimes I get students that are taking a course like this. They're they're uh, not for a grade, uh, but just for their own information. Maybe they're auditing the course, or maybe they're retired and they're just kind of interested in the topic. Uh, so, for example, for that, uh, perfect attendance, you know, for them, it's not going to be, they don't really care about bonus points or, or anything like that. Uh, they're not even getting a grade in the class anyway. Uh, so I'd have to think about some different benefits if I really wanted to persuade them uh, that they needed to be at every class. And I could do that with uh, some combination of these, uh, intrinsic and extrinsic benefits built in versus uh, extrinsic. Uh, so you could think about uh, you know, an intrinsic benefit. Uh, let, let's take the example of uh, working out. So let's say you work at a gym, uh, Gold's Gym, let's say, and you're trying to think of some benefits. And the intrinsic benefits would be, you know, you think about exercising regularly, you might feel healthier, uh, you might improve your strength, uh, you might, uh, you know, ha have a sense of well-being, uh, <laughs> maybe it's just fun. Uh, so those are this kind of the built-in rewards. Or with a class, you know, I could say, well, you should want to learn, right? Just learning in and of itself is a good thing. It makes you feel, feel smarter, you'll you be wiser. <laughs> Uh, so those are intrinsic ones. And then the extrinsic stuff added on. So I guess I could say, you know, if you come to every class, I'll give you a cookie. Or you'll get, uh, you know, if you work out, maybe somebody pays you to work out. Or maybe you'll get a deduction to your, uh, on your insurance health plan or whatever. Uh, so you see how those are a little bit different, like the extrinsic one, or the intrinsic one's kind of built into the activity. And the extrinsic would be some kind of bonus or uh, some type of uh, added on thing. Uh, that doesn't, it's not part of the activity itself. Uh, another sort of thing that might, uh, I think about too, is uh, uh, with with education, educational games. So a lot of instructors, they say, well, wouldn't it be nice if we had more, if students could just play these games and, and the games would be learning, or they could learn by playing the game. And there's different types of educational games. Some are use the game uh, extrinsically. So the idea is, well, you do this, do these math problems, and then as a reward, you get to drive this car around the track. You know, ooh, okay, that's fun. Uh, now do some more math problems. Uh, so you see the, the, the game is just kind of the, like some candy, or it's, it's like a little bonus, uh, versus other kind of educational games where the education is actually built in to the game. Uh, so instead of uh, do some math problems and then you can play the game, it's, it's like the... Uh, uh, a game like uh, Oregon Trail, uh, if you remember that one, or some game where the uh, uh, civilization, or uh, I'm trying to think of some other ones, uh, but basically where the you're learning, the game is the learning, right? It's not separated uh, like it is with that intrinsic one. Or you can prove with clear logic and, and use vivid detail uh, to explain. Uh, you certainly see that a whole lot with uh, Sup health supplements. Well, maybe you don't see, <laughs> maybe you don't see this uh, so much, uh, but they always try to at least sound like they're being really clear and logical uh, about why you should take this supplement. 
Uh, I think it's, to me, I usually don't agree with them. I think there's a lot of pseudoscience with those, but, uh, you know, I would, I definitely think uh, you should join a gym or at least work out and exercise uh, regularly, uh, regularly, right? Uh, so I could see somebody saying, well, uh, you'll feel better, but, um, So let's look at identifying and developing these benefits some more. Uh, so the identifying the needs, feelings, and wants uh, that may motivate the audience. So as a professor, you know, one of the things I can, I know that you need is uh, the, the grade. <laughs> you need points. You need A's. Uh, and then they, I know that you have feelings, right? You, um, you want to do well in the class. You might be scared of, of flunking out. And ultimately, I know what you want, right? You, you want the great, you want the good grade, you want to do well, you want to be successful. Uh, so I can tap into all of these things to motivate you. Um, objective features of your product or policy that could meet the needs. You know, we have talked often, you know, often in the class about how, you know, the stuff has direct bearing on uh, like things like resumes. If you know how to write grammatically correctly and punctuate your sentences the right way and all this good stuff, uh, that's going to be, that's just objectively going to be uh, better uh, and when you sit down to write that resume uh, than if you don't have this. Uh, same thing with, uh, you know, if you imagine if you're trying to advertise your gym and you know that you've got machines in your gym that this other gym doesn't, that's an objective feature. It's something you could point at and say, look, We've got more machines than this other place. So it's not an opinion, you know, it's an objective feature. Uh, showing how the audience's needs uh, can be met with those features. So this would be a good place if, you, if maybe you got your gym has more up-to-date equipment. Uh, so you could say, look, our, uh, our treadmills have heart rate monitors built in. Uh, so you can actually see you know how hard you're working and if you need to step it up or slow it down uh, we have that technology uh, this other place doesn't so it kind of ties into number two all right so let's finish up here by thinking about multiple audiences and you know a lot of times you can't do the one size fits all uh, document or proposal there's going to be different audiences with different needs and they talked here about gatekeeper and uh, primary audiences and I'll give this example from my, my own life is when I'm trying to publish a book. Uh, the gatekeeper might be an editor, just somebody I know uh, that works for a publisher. And they can they ultimately get to say whether or not they take it to the board uh, for approval to get, you know, and basically get it into publication. Uh, but, I, you know, I know that person a lot better than I do the primary audience. A lot of times I have no idea who's on this board never meet them. I don't go to any of the meetings. Uh, the gatekeeper handles all that. Uh, so I'm just sort of working with this gatekeeper the whole time. And I have to be, uh, I guess, less formal with this gatekeeper than I do when I eventually write the proposal uh, that the gatekeeper will take to this primary audience. So for example, the content and the number of details. Uh, so a lot of times the gatekeeper, uh, when we're just starting out, uh, he or she will just say, well, just give me kind of a general idea about what you want to write about, a uh, number of pages and so on. What's the topic? Uh, so it can be vague. Uh, but when it gets to this primary audience, though, uh, that's when we really have to start filling in all the content, the details. It has to be a very, uh, it has to be fairly extensive because they don't know me. You know, they, they don't know anything about the book. Uh, they, they don't tr basically don't trust you like the gatekeeper does. Uh, so they have to have a lot of specifics. Uh, the organization, and I would just go ahead and jump to this one too, the level of formality will change too, obviously. Uh, the gatekeeper, we might just talk on the phone uh, about the book, the book idea, um, very informally, kind of loose, you know, it's, it's not like you sit down and make a plan for this phone call. Uh, but when it gets to that formal proposal, then obviously it's organized very well and it's, it's a lot more formal. And then finally, the technical level. Uh, usually, at least in my experience, the editors that work with me know a lot more about the subject than the publisher. So you can imagine these big publishing houses, 
Uh, they publish books in all kinds of different topics, and they have different editors in those for the different areas. Uh, so, like the, for the ones I work with are usually uh, game design editors or game develop interest somehow related to video games, right? Uh, so they know a lot about video games. So I can talk to them at a technical level about it. But when they go to take the proposal to this primary audience, you know, again, these are just this is these just publishing people. They, they, maybe they've never even played a video game. They don't even care about it. Uh, so the technical level is going to be much different there. Uh, so that might help you to get into that one, I hope. All right. Woo. Again, uh, <clears throat> I hope I haven't blown you away with too much information. If you do have questions or comments, so please let me know. I'd love to hear that. Uh, otherwise, uh, have a good day and see you next time.